This is the Humerian Health Podcast. Spilling our guts for the well-being of yours. Today, unexpected recoveries, seven steps to healing body, mind, and soul when serious illness strikes. This should be a really good conversation. I'm looking forward to this a lot. For a lot of reasons. And it's not just life and death diseases. It's any kind of illness. And that could be your illness. could be your mate's illness. I mean, what's the, what's the understanding that if your mate's really sick on a chronic long-term disease, the person who dies first often is the caregiver. caregiver. Yep. And we're going to do some caregiver programs and give you some indicators and some ideas what to do because that's not covered enough. But if you do have the illness or someone you love has the has an illness, exactly how do you get through it? Because yeah, you got medical treatment or chiropractic or osteopathic or this or that, all those types of things you might be actually doing. The question is, how do you get through it right. mentally, emotionally, physically, financially, Spiritually. chemically? Yep. How do you that, take yep. control back of your life? Because illness takes you out. Yes. Uh, here's here's the worst patient. Never get sick. If they oh, never right. get sick, they're worth, oh, it's awful. And I'm, I'm, one, you're gonna I'm, say you're I'm one of those people. A man is a worst a patient. Man. No. <laughs> That's Sorry. close. That's exactly I, it. I was waiting yeah, oh, wait for a minute. it. Wait a minute. Why you, oh. That's what I do. You don't do that. <laughs> well, you're the worst you of the worst. The you're a man and a doctor. Oh, oh, I have no chance. You know. But no, I think no, that uh, people who have often on illnesses, I think, do a better job because they have developed some of these coping mechanisms uh, that the author, uh, the author that we're going to be interviewing, Tom, is going to be talking about. So we're going to be interviewing Tom Monte. Let's go. So we're here today with Tom Monty, who wrote a book called Unexpected Recoveries. We're super excited to have you on the show, Tom. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Well, see, I'm unbelievably excited. She's just super excited. I'm super so excited. So that makes us super <laughs> unbelievably, unbelievably excited. excited. That's right. <laughs> awesome. So I, let's just start a little bit with your background. So, you, so you're not a trained medical physician, but you've worked as a health counselor and in basically medicine for 30 plus years. So Talk to us a little bit about your journey. Well, to start out with, I, I became interested in health at a very, very early age, um, my relatively early, in my early 20s. And, you know, I just, I, I just started reading about health and recovery. I, I got involved in macrobiotics, um, which was one of the early uh, programs for restoring health. Right. And it just went on from there. And I started working with medical doctors and scientists as well, I wrote, I wrote, I've written more than 35 books, and many of them were with medical doctors who were on the cutting edge of healing using diet and, and lifestyle to address very, very serious illnesses, cancer, heart disease, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, uh, arthritis. Even in the case of Nathan Pritikin, yeah. he was even healing people with, with blindness yeah. and also early-stage dementia. Wow. Um, so... There were a wide spectrum of illnesses that were um, being addressed by lifestyle uh, practitioners, especially medical doctors and scientists, um, and, and at the core of it was, was diet. But there were other important factors that made diet possible, that is to say, made it possible for people to adopt a healing diet. But there were other very, very important lifestyle factors that were there. So I studied with medical doctors. I studied with a wide array of complementary medicine practitioners, Chinese medicine, Ayurveda, healing touch of all kinds. I wrote a lot of books, a number of books on uh, healing touch of various kinds, Jinshin Jitsu, Acupressure, Shiatsu, mm. others. So that I, I got a really good education in science, uh, medicine, and uh, complementary medicine. And I was the editor of Nutrition Action for a while, which is Center for Science in the Public Interest. So I got really deep in the science of nutrition as well. So it, it all came together and people started asking me to give talks and then people wanted me to start counseling them. And, and that was where it started, the counseling. And that I've been doing that for more than 30 years. Wonderful. You know, I, I will tell you the, the reason that uh, when I had got, because I review all these books, uh, um, Amy and I tried, tried to sit down and review the books and see, first of all, if the contents, what our listeners want, we have um, six pillars of health that we uh, work through and uh, we try to make sure that they align. And then also that the education that's coming forward is a positive reinforcement message that also can be applied in real life, which is the probably the 
toughest thing, which is being able to hear something and actually learn how to apply it. So I, I, that's why I think for me, I was very excited about the integration of your book, because you can see uh, this is a book that's tied together a lot of different right. uh, uh, concepts and ideas all at one. But I want to follow up with one thing, Nathan Pritikin. Now, his, his diet uh, was very a uh, very restricted diet, um, but you said that there was more to it because a lot of the listeners, I interviewed Dr. Pritikin years ago uh, when I was doing radio for 21 years, and it was a pretty restrictive diet. I think it was a low-fat diet, but don't quote me on that. Um, but you said his even his, his work was more than diet. Can you elaborate a little bit? I'm just more for curiosity. Yes. Um, first of all, he had a, 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 an extensive exercise program um, that was very much integral to his his, his overall approach. Yeah, he's a distance um, runner, right? Distance running? He, he was a runner. runner Long right. before there were runners. In right. 1950, he became a runner. Um, and, you know, he even designed his own running shoe um, because yep. there weren't running shoes at the time. That's right. <laughs> so, yes, he was a runner, mm-hmm. but he also had uh, a really in-depth understanding of human condition without being able to express that part of things. I think he was, um, he was focused primarily on diet and exercise. That was his, his, his focus. Remember that he was doing this. He he was really doing this as a very, as a pioneer in the 1960s and even earlier when he was studying the relationship between diet and health and exercise and health. But he was counseling people in the 1960s, and it wasn't until the 70s and 80s that he came to prominence. That's right. But he had a deeper understanding of, of what people needed, and he he communicated many things without naming them specifically. He was very, very encouraging. He was very, very positive. He also understood the connection between, you know, smaller meals, um, you know, disciplining oneself, understanding the connection between you know, habits, good habits maintained over time and how important they were. So there were a lot of things that were sort of, you know, intangibles with Nathan, but uh, he didn't articulate them as such because I think the primary focus was on the diet and the exercise for him. Yeah, yeah that, I think that was the book, and that's what everyone focused on because they, they could sink into that. But this is a lot deeper, isn't it? The idea of facing a serious disease or have been through a serious disease, what that does to the person, how it changes their life, you know, some for the positive and some toss in the towel. I mean, the real question is, uh, when you get a hold of someone who is facing Let's say it's not life-threatening, but a chronic disease, a serious disease. Um, don't you work? You have to work with them not only personally, but you have to work with them also their family because it affects everyone. Correct? You're absolutely right. When you speak about the family, what you're really saying is the mindset of the family, the values of the family, what we believe is possible and what we believe is not possible. Mm-hmm. Those are really the underlying barriers to getting well against any problem or overcoming any challenge in life. We have to first change the thinking, and the family is oftentimes, obviously, the origin of that thinking. And whatever they're willing to investigate or not willing to investigate, oftentimes defines what what are the limits or the possibilities for the person. So that's a good point. You're absolutely right. The family is, and also the person needs the family's love and support. And what people don't realize is that when someone in the family gets sick, it's an opportunity for the entire family to grow. And it isn't just a major illness, but it's a chronic illness or it's perhaps a mental struggle. The whole family must change, and, and it can change for the better. In fact, that's, that's what's being offered. And so, yes, the family is very much integral to the entire healing process. Does that involve including alcoholism, drug addiction problems, including uh, chronic heart conditions, diabetes, et cetera? Is that all kind of grouped together? Uh, you know, there's different application of therapy and treatment, I get. But as for the family, how do you wrap them to be involved? Because, hey, um, okay, the guy drinks a lot, drinks so much, uh, it's, it's ruining their lives. Uh, and you're trying to tell the family, hey, you got to step up and help these people. Some of them don't want to. Or the diabetic that ate uh, bonbons, uh, sugar palms, and whatever <laughs> other sugary stuff and had a high-stress, alcohol-based diet. How do you wrap a family around that? Because they do need it. 
But man, aren't they a little worn out by this? I mean, aren't they a little bit like, hey, this is your this is your issue, not ours? Exactly right. That's oftentimes the case. And and you put your finger on what is the underlying issue, a great deal of anger and disbelief of what is possible. People are drinking, you know, alcohol, especially when they do it excessively or taking drugs because they are suffering some from so much stress, so much pain, so much internal wounding that they're using those substances as a means of ameliorating the pain that they, they, they suffer from. What I do always is I never judge. I try to get to the roots of the problem without making anyone feel shame or, or make them feel smaller. And I also want them, I want them to understand that, you know, there is a great deal of anger in them and that anger stems from deep disappointment in life. Right. And very often they're using drugs and alcohol to deal with that disappointment. They have to understand, number one, that a great deal more happiness and experience in the positive is possible for them. They have to understand that that's possible. And I can oftentimes identify what is possible and also to give them the means to see it themselves. So they have to see that. Number two, they can't feel that they're doing something, you know, moralistically wrong. They have to realize that they're dealing with their pain in an ineffective way and it's not efficient. Mm -hmm. And so let's identify, let's talk about the pain, what it is that you're really suffering from, and then let's talk about ways that are really going to heal that pain. Alcohol puts people out of their misery temporarily and then multiplies the misery afterward. It's the same with any drug. So we have to talk about how everything's going downhill as, or everything's going to a greater uh, degree of darkness as a consequence of the alcohol or the drug addiction, and that the person that they love in their family is suffering right now. And it needs, everyone needs to step up and do a little bit better with their lives. That's what's possible. And it, it, very often it's the love that they have for their, their son or their daughter, their, their wife or their husband, their partner. Um, you know, it's very often the love that saves everybody. So that's what we have to focus on. And then the practical measures, which every one of the steps in the, pro, in, the, in, the, in the program that I describe in my book, every one of those steps is, a, is an act of love. Dealing with fear, effectively, is an act of love. And then there's a whole prescription for that. Taking responsibility, learning more about the illness, learning more about what, what you're actually struggling against. That's an act of love. All the investigation that one spends time and, and, and achieves a certain clarity around, okay, this is the illness and this is what we have to do. And this is what the medical profession is saying. This is what the complementary healers are saying. The diet is so important. It's central. And what can it do? What will it do for us? And how much time do we need to be on this before it starts to have a real big impact? That's all that whole investigation into that. The daily cooking is an act of love. Eating it carefully, sitting with it every, sitting with family members, it's all an act of love. Developing loving relationships, getting healing touch, all of it is, heal, is, is an act of love. Developing commitment, going into the darkness of, in one's interior life. Is, a, is, a, is an investigation that is only possible through compassion and love and developing faith, of course, and then a, a, a sense of purpose. These are the steps, and they're every one of them an act of love. So that's very often the thing that pulls the family in, in a whole other direction. Okay, let's, um, let's uh, role play. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm if afraid. You're up for it, I'm, Tom. I'm afraid already. Hey, no, l- l- listen, Unless we're going to use you as the patient target, Doctor Benzinger. Okay, good. Okay, because that's right, perfect. you know permanently my life uh, lifestyle. The bad guy. Okay, but um, but Tom, if you'll play with us and just see, because your book. I mean, uh, let me tell you the, my impression of listening to you: soothing, knowledgeable, unconditional approach to help somebody. Yeah, I, I hear that in your voice. I mean, it really, mm-hmm. if I, if, if, if I got, I got patients, I'm like, if you're here in Indy, you're, you're getting lined <laughs> up. You would have like a, a, a few thousand people to work with because you, you can tell you have it. I hope you're not just writing books and not dealing with patients because. Oh, no, I, I am. I'm good, dealing with a lot of clients. Oh man, you're just good. Uh, but I, thank you so much for uh, saying that. It, it comes through in what was that? What? Three minutes right. comes through. Yeah. Didn't you feel that way? Yeah. I mean, it's just soothing. You could just listen to him and it's like, it gives 
gives you hope when you don't have hope and things are hard. And okay, so let's, uh, if I can, just a short role play and go from there because, um, you know, the first part of getting through the shock is a big deal. So let's just say I come home to wife Amy. Oh boy. We're pretending. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, <laughs> Jeff, don't don't. Yeah, my okay. husband's. Not gonna yeah, be. <laughs> husband's not gonna be okay. Okay, so so wife Amy, I come home and I now have been diagnosed with diabetes, severe, and a heart condition uh, that's uh, surgically cannot be repaired. Going to have to deal with it, and eventually I'll end up with a heart replacement. Now the truth of the matter is, I've been a workaholic that has put my family secondly a second. I don't exercise, and my wife, who has been preparing great meals at home, I ignore, and I go to the local fast food restaurant, and I have my, you know, my fifth of whiskey when I get home just to tolerate dealing with my family. And I, and I know that sounds extreme, but honestly, that's not that extreme. But let's just say that that's me. And, and, and now, what would you do to help us with, first thing, I've had to explain it to Amy, Amy's in shock. I'm in shock because I thought I was going to get away with it forever. And now we're sitting down with you. What do you do with this? How do you walk us through this? Because your book is it. And we don't have a long time. I know you're just going to jump because they're going to have to buy unexpected recoveries because they need to. You have poured so much into this. So we're going to highly recommend it. But I think this might help the listeners be able to put themselves in a position of a lost loved one, an Alzheimer's patient, uh, an autistic child, whatever. Well, and the where That's to start, reality. right? The where to start. Where do That's you start? what we're what always do do? trying to so, help people with. Yeah. Would you mind starting with Amy and I, and see if we can help help us? Not at all. I'm happy to address, unless assuming I'm talking to you, Sean, or, or you, Amy, I, and obviously it would be different because you're the spouse, Amy, and, and, and Sean, you're the, the one who hypothetically is suffering. The first thing we have to do is to go into the suffering. Well, there is no way that we can avoid the darkness that you as, as a client, as, as, a, as a someone who is now suffering diabetes, heart condition, possibly uh, some dependence upon alcohol, and so forth, okay. and all the things you listed, we must understand the suffering. And so the first thing I want to do with both of you is to evoke in an atmosphere that is very nonjudgmental everything that you've been carrying. Why are you a workaholic? Because you're going to tell me, I have to support my family, and right. I'm going to say, right. you're, you're doing my job. Right. I'm doing my job. You're doing your job. You're doing your job as a man and as a father, as a husband. You're doing what needs to be done. Correct. However, you are suffering so much, and your life needs to suddenly widen. And I will articulate all the areas that your life needs to widen and how nurturing that is. And how when you look up from all your work and all the struggles you're, you're carrying, you start to see a different life. You start to see that there are so many things that I want to enjoy in this life, including the love of my wife, my family, that I'm missing. And I'm carrying these burdens, and they're finally manifesting as very serious illnesses. That's number one. We start to think, okay, there's great, great suffering, and there's a great opportunity to expand your, the aperture from which you can see life. And I start to articulate what, what's possible there in terms of what you can be seeing, including spending time with your, with your loving wife who's walked through life with you as an act of love through the, all these years and has, has been with you through thick and thin. And it's time now to experience your, the depth of your gratitude and the depth of your love for this person and the family you, you, you have. Second thing you have to do is you understand that you are using substances, that is to say food, alcohol, other things, other behaviors, that are number one causing you tremendous distress. I understand that they're using you're using them to alleviate pain in the short term, but what they're doing is instead they're ta- taxing your body and your your mind and your heart tremendously, and they're weakening everything. Meantime, your heart every day pumps a hundred thousand times. It 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 still soldiers on for you for a reason to keep you alive to keep you going. There must be a reason for that beyond just. Your survival, but the but the substances you are using to ameliorate your pain is causing you tremendous pain, tremendous suffering. It's causing your whole family to witness your decline and tremendous suffering. You have to understand that that suffering is spreading throughout the family, and it diminishes everyone's hope. It carries so much pain; it's an unspoken pain that we're all carrying together as a family. Mm-hmm. 
And you have to understand, too, that there's tremendous anger, consequence of the alcohol, but also the, the suffering, because you have been deprived. You've been deprived of the joy of living. Even while it's being served to you every single day, you feel deprived of that, and you have tremendous anger. And at the bottom of that anger, there is truth. And the truth is this. Why is there no place for me in this life? Why does nothing work for me? Why am I carrying these burdens? I love these people so much, but there never has been room for me. That's when we start to hit pay dirt, because when you realize that there never has been a place for you in this world, and that all you've been is a, is a mule to carry the burdens for, for yourself and for others, and that no one really wanted that among the people who you're with now, when you realize that, you realize that I must do something about that because they love me. I love myself. I have to act in ways that love myself. I have to start to realize that there is another way of life. There is something beyond the anger. But at the bottom of the anger, there is truth. And once you encounter that truth, what you're going to do is you're going to tumble into sadness. I hmm. spent my life doing things for others and neglecting myself. And there is tremendous sadness. Once you hit that sadness, you're going to fall into compassion for yourself. And that's when we can make a difference for everybody. When there is compassion, consciousness is layered. And when you enter the deeper layers of consciousness, you get to the healing energies, sadness, compassion, and the infinite love that exists in every person. And all the healing energies, those frequencies that change the way every cell functions and the intelligence that lives in those energies starts to be able to make a difference in your life. And then you begin to see how important taking the burdens of the physical body with, the, with changes in diet, taking a walk every day, you know, diminishing with the intention of stopping the alcohol. In fact, stopping the alcohol is, is a very, very important step. But the first step may be diminishing it for the purposes of just experiencing a smaller burden on oneself. And then we can introduce other things. As long as you're not eating foods that are highly stimulating and highly burdensome to the body, the need for the alcohol will gradually diminish until finally you can say, I don't really need this at all anymore. But we need to change the diet fundamentally. We need to get some exercise. We need to get a lot of healing touch. Once you start being touched, by the way, healing touch dramatically elevates serotonin levels in the brain, which gives us a sense of well-being, gives us a sense of being cared for, loved, all that energy of healers, which transmits so many volts of healing energy, so much in the Manager Foundation and other places that have studied what takes place when a person who has a gifted healing touch touches another human being and transmits so much energy. It changes the nervous system, brain chemistry, lowers dopamine, elevates serotonin, other things that go on, improves circulation. All those things are going to make you feel so much better that the need for the, for the drug is not going to be present to the degree. And one day you're going to wake up and say, wow, life is worth living. And life is worth being with the people I deeply care for. And you're going to be in a very, very different setting with yourself and with the people who really matter most in your life. At that point, you can't help but realize that something larger than yourself a greater intelligence, something divine in nature was guiding you the whole time. And then there's a breakthrough. And then everything is possible at that point. So do you believe, and I'm just going to jump on that point just for a moment, um, two things that, that on higher power frequently comes into play with change? That's absolutely, the, not only is it a statement of belief, it's a statement of fact. You have 100 trillion cells Every one of those cells are doing things that no, nothing in your mental faculties could possibly even comprehend, much less direct. There are tiny protein messengers called kinases traveling to distinct locations on a 23,000 gene genome. They're, doing, they're taking things to mitochondria. They're taking things to the cell membrane, opening insulin receptor sites and other, other activities on the cell membrane. They're doing things right now, 100 trillion cells doing things right now that nothing in our minds could possibly, possibly be directing. There's, a, there's, a, there's an intelligence that's directing the entire organism on a cellular level and on a, on a total symphony level that is on one hand on acting microscopically and adjusting to stresses, oxygen, carbon dioxide levels, immune cells, pathogens in the environment, making adjustments that are just beyond anything comprehensible by human intelligence. There's an intelligence that's doing everything in this. 
for you very differently than for Amy, very differently for me in this this moment because we have we're in different environments. All of that is making distinct and very precise adjustments for one purpose, for you to function optimally. And that inherently is love. And that love is trying to guide us in every single aspect of our lives, not just the cellular function, although that by itself is a mind-boggling uh, feat of itself. But it's, it's something that's wanting to guide us in every facet. How did you two of you meet? Just whenever I ask somebody that, they love telling me, what well, we met in this way, and it's, these synchronicities took place, and it was magical. And of course it was. Something brought you together. Something brings people together. An intelligence that is inherently, first of all, a woven web throughout the universe, but is, is inherently acting from love to support you in a process. And when you get that, when you start to, you know, eat a little bit better, take better care of yourself, awaken to the love that's around you, you start to hold that as a possibility. There's something that's helping me. And that's enough usually to make a huge difference internally, especially in terms of one's health. But Tom, just so you know, when Amy and I met, she ran over me on a <laughs> roller derby. Um, <laughs> And, and, not true. So, so I did not run you over. It wasn't the most pleasant uh, memory. I did it in love. Uh, but... I did it in love. <laughs> actually, no. I love, um, Tom, actually, I love all of what you're, I mean, you've hit on so many kind of yeah. critical areas yeah. from um, uh, practical, super practical things like, you know, what you eat and and how you move and exercise. And then maybe some things that people are perhaps a little less familiar with, possibly in the healing specialties that you talked about um, and, and really how those work. Um, and then our commitment to change and like really mm -hmm. like dig through and understand our past and our suffering and kind of to get to that truth. I, I that was so well articulated. Mm -hmm. I love that. But one of the things um, I think that is also part of the process that you talked about um, in the book which came as a surprise to me a little bit is the community service aspect or the sort of giving back aspect. Um, I mean, can you share a little bit about kind of why that is sort of also baked into or, or contemplated as part of this process and, and why that is critical on the pathway to recovery? That's so important. You recall, I'm sure recall, Carl Simonton, Texas physician who worked with cancer patients and who made many uh, discoveries of the, the psychological, spiritual nature in which people who had unfinished business and were committed to finishing that business, that is to say, I, I want to see my daughter graduate from college, or I've got to work something out with my son, or I've got to heal my relationship with my wife. Those people who had some unfinished business that they were completed, they were committed to completing, those people lived longer than people who felt that they, they had finished their lives or were not capable of succeeding in areas that they thought were crucial to their lives. So there's this aspect of life that is the will to do something greater than just my survival. And the New York Times had a great article in, in January of 2000, or actually in the early part of the year of 2000, what happened was that people uh, died in record numbers in January 2000. And it turned out that what they discovered when researchers looked at that more carefully, well, what was the reason? And they realized that people were willing themselves to see the new millennium come in. They thought it was very, very important to see the year 2000 come into, the, come into being. And so what they did was they willed themselves. And when the researchers looked at this, they, they acknowledged, yes, that's very, that's what happened. And also it was, it's possible to will ourselves to to live a little, to live longer on a basis of something we want to accomplish. People who have a purpose live longer. And now lots of studies looking at this very question have been done. And it's, it's fascinating to see that what is the, the meaning of purpose? What is the essence of it? And in the essence of it, of course, is love. That is to say, I want to fulfill something that makes someone else's life better. I want to heal my relationship with my, my son or my daughter or my husband or my wife because I have my enormous love for them, number one, and because my love for them instructs me to make their lives in some way better, healthier, heal, heal what has taken place in the past. Whenever that occurs, the life force, this, this intelligence that is driving the processes on a very intimate biological level and also a larger spiritual 
uh, aspects of us, that life force becomes galvanized. Purpose drives us on. There's a lot of research about uh, regarding volunteers who, um, you know, go into the fifth grade and help people with literacy or mathematics and so forth, or help people with their businesses for free. They give free advice. Volunteers who, who engage in all kinds of service uh, help. When particularly when they're retired or they're, they've, they've done other things, they have a certain certain specialty, expertise in certain areas, and they share that with others. Volunteers experience greater health. They live longer. They experience far more joy. They see life in far more rewarding terms. They have a reason to get up in the morning and a reason to give themselves entirely to life. They forget their own pains, their own struggles, their own complaints. And they, they are rewarded with all this because they feel this makes a difference in somebody's life and my life makes a difference. And therefore, I want to go on doing this. That changes their life. It changes the lives of others. We need to realize that our purpose is not mere survival. That always leads to the dark side, meaning if my survival is my, my primary focus, it means that everyone else around me is a threat because they, in some way, can take away the resources that I feel I need to survive. Survival is not the answer. We need to focus on what is of the common good. And whenever people do that, their health responds very, very positively. They experience far more joy and they live longer. And that tells us a lot about, number one, the human organism and the human design, but also tells us a lot about whatever created us the creator of this design, the nature of that creator. So, you know, it's, you, we can say that you can do the practical thing. Find a purpose and just experience what it does for you. And very often I'll say that. But if somebody's interested in the larger implications of what that means, which most virtually everyone is, then we can understand things from a very practical level, that is the biological reactions that take place as a consequence of purpose and what they may mean in terms of our place in the universe and our purpose for living. Excellent. Excellent. Like usual, our, our interviews are never long enough. <laughs> Tom, true. I, I, I will tell you, we, I could do this all day. Um, but let me ask you uh, one quick question before we uh, close. Uh, well, I, I think I got three questions. <laughs> Never mind. Um, what you took us through with our kind of our, our fake Amy, Dr. B thing, that's kind of a, a rounding off of a general pattern of what would occur no matter what someone's going through, correct? I mean, it's kind of a general pattern of realization and understanding and reasons and truths and purpose change and anger and then and then of course uh, passion uh, the sadness and then the passion for life that's kind of a pattern no matter what serious thing you hit isn't it you're absolutely right okay. you're absolutely right so people, we can kind of count go, on that what's that we can kind of count on that pattern to be what we have to get through no matter what we're facing a loss of absolutely an individual right. and we must never ever Though people are common, we're taught this in, in, in Western culture to deny the pain and the suffering and to somehow yeah, act like you know, it's not there. Positively. Deal with it. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Deal with it stoically or think positively and, 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 and then that is bury it. And burying it is never going to be the answer. We must bring awareness to it. Once we do that, we begin to have compassion for ourselves. So, yeah, it, it's a very, that's, that's, that's an important set of steps for, for anyone dealing with any challenge. Mm-hmm. So how does our listeners get your book? Um, through Square One, through Amazon, through any Barnes & Noble, through any uh, outlet, um, online outlet, or ordering it if it's not in the bookstores. Uh, Square One publishers, um, obviously, is always happy to send it. Um, there's, there's lots of ways to get it. Uh, and okay. also, any any bookstore can order it as well if they don't already have it. Unexpected recoveries. We will uh, hopefully at a later date get an opportunity to interview you for some of your other books. But we want to thank you for being on today. It was wonderful information, and I and I hope our listeners took it seriously. Yeah, thanks so much. Thank you both so much for all the great work you're doing, and also for having me on the show today. I really, really appreciate it. It's all about the love. That's right. That's kind of what I heard. No, yeah, it I is. was really, I really liked the process walkthrough. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, we've heard of like the stages of grief and things mm-hmm. like that, but just the sort of practical nature of 
kind of doesn't matter what you're going through, whether it's cancer diagnosis or losing a spouse or losing a job or whatever. I mean, you're going to... Hey, getting married, having children, life changes are huge. And of course, they all come in threes times three. Um, (laughs) That's the real life. And the issue is how many... If you sit down with most people, I don't think they would say, okay, you know, the first thing is to get better is what do you believe? Do you believe you're going to get better? Do you believe you should Mm -hmm. get better? Do you feel guilty? Or is there anger? Are you still frustrated? You know, wow, what a great tie-in. That's why I I wanted to hear more about it. And I know that kind of ran on a little bit about him explaining. But the truth of the matter is, I I just think everybody needs to realize there's a process of recovery with every injury. Sure. And because you don't see it, because you don't have a broken arm and a cast to show a picture and a big scar for the surgery, the, um, that, and I think that's what we're ignoring as Americans. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I'm sure it's worldwide to some extent, but wow, do we ignore it. Um, right. Let's 80, Remember, 87% let's just give you the pill, but all of a sudden we don't want to sit. The doc doesn't have enough time to say, well, gee, Amy, you know that schmuck husband of yours, uh, that's you know Dr. Benzinger, that's such a waste of uh, space. Uh, that really makes a difference. Mm-hmm. So. We are going to have to talk about your diabetic diagnosis. Just <laughs> and my heart disease and my... Yeah. my... Well, and there's the, there's that sort of um, uh, like accidental condition. Like, oh, I just got diagnosed with diabetes. How did that happen? Oh, I mean, that, that yeah. never happened. But yeah, so I also appreciated yeah. that more. I mean, it's the holistic thing, right? Like, what is it about your life and what you believe about yourself that results in the behaviors that you exhibit, which mm-hmm. then result in the health conditions that you suffer from, which then put you on that Absolutely. path to recovery. And it's d- not a one and done deal. Right? No, and it's yeah. a process of yeah. understanding. But I really like the don't judge. And right. I was thinking about you at that point. I'm thinking, don't judge. Don't judge. Well, Hashtag don't I'm judge. sorry, but if it was switched, I don't know that I could not be a little torqued at you. I'm feeding these good meals mm-hmm. and we got a family situation and you ignore it. You won't eat it. You're drinking whatever and you're ignoring us and we don't have a relationship. I'd I'd have to be work through yeah, yeah the sure, anger sure. aspect associated with it. Yeah. It's not like, oh, you got this diagnosis. Oh, let's just act like you're yeah. Mr. Wonderful all the time. It's not. <laughs> I don't believe that. No. 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 It's just well, not that and way. The, I like, the other thing I liked about what he talked about is the whole community part too, mm-hmm. right? Like, I mean, I think we all hear things from different people in our given circumstance. Right. And sometimes you can hear that from the person that you love. Sometimes you have to hear that from, you know, a friend. Sometimes it's a counselor. Sometimes it's a, you know, it's a physical healer. Sometimes it's your doctor. Sometimes, you know, it's, it just takes But it needs a to be someone yeah. and something. And yeah. it's many times a community and a fam- right. family environment. Right. It's not just one. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. great show. Yeah. So like yeah. all of our um, other author interviews, we'll be doing a little giveaway with this one yep. as well. And so super and Q&A excited about follow that. up. If you've got yep. questions, fire them off to in our Facebook or our humarian.com. Fire them in our Facebook. <laughs> fire. No, don't fire yeah, actually, Facebook, no, that's a good but, point. You should yeah. definitely should be following us on Facebook. We also have humarian.com, our website, where our podcasts uh, all live, as well as blogs mm-hmm. and lots of other great content. So yeah, definitely We're tying you out. together with these people, folks. So I hope you're sharing this with other family and friends. It's not just, I listen to podcast, gee, it was kind of interesting. You should listen to it. It's also, hey, you might be able to ask a question. They'll, they'll fire it off to these people once we accumulate right. a few, and we'll get back to you with them and you'll be able to listen to it and say, hey, that was my question. And wow, that's really cool. And it's not just a one-off and they're not, they don't not care. Exactly. Absolutely. So we would appreciate you tuning in. Amy, as always, so much fun. (laughs) Always. Have a good day and may God bless. Amy Baker, Dr. Sean Benzinger. Humarian Health Podcast. Spilling our guts. For the well-being of yours. That's right. Thanks for having the guts to listen to the Humarian Health Podcast. If you have things you'd like to gut check, send us an email at gutcheck at humarian.com. 